Okay, so let's uh, let's start now with the wave equation. So we want to apply the same Fourier series techniques to solve for the wave equation. Um, this model is basically a string on an axis. Uh, I'll write down the main set of equations here as we did before. So the heat equation was a PDE, ut is equal to kappa uxx. The wave equation is looks a lot like the heat equation. The difference is that you have utt is equal to c squared uxx. Okay. C here is known as the wave speed. It corresponds to, so it involves the string property. So the, if you remember, we had derived these equations um, from sort of first principles, from thinking of Newtonian laws, and we uh, took into account the density of the string and um, so the density and the mass. I mean, that's basically, it was just density and mass and tension of the string. And from that, we obtained the C parameter. So the C parameter will characterize different strings of different thicknesses or stiffnesses. We're going to think of the boundary condition of U of zero and T being zero and U of uh, L and T being zero. So these are Dirichlet uh, homogeneous boundary conditions, zero boundary conditions. Um, and there's the Neumann version of the problem where it's a derivative um, here instead of U. And I think that's on the problem sets. And what's and we'll need an initial displacement for the string. So this you can imagine this is a string of length l, zero l, undeflected length l, and the string deflects like so. That deflection is measured by the u. And so the PDE should give you the equation of string at each position x. So this is an x. And in time, here this is in the case where the string is being pinned at both ends, so one at um, height zero and the other at height zero. And you can change that problem, right? You can have one at zero and the other at one or something like that. And then, so we need to specify the initial position of the string. So that would be u of x and zero being a u naught of x. And I also need to specify the initial velocity of the string. So that's a ut of x and 0 being a v naught of x. Okay, so the, the initial velocity of the string is what differentiates this treatment, this set of PEs from the heat equation. In the heat equation, you didn't need the velocity. You only needed the, uh, the analogy of the velocity. You only needed the initial temperature. Here, because the wave equation is second order in time, it's a UTT then just like in ODEs, you need two boundary conditions in time here, and so you need the initial position and also the initial uh, uh, velocity of the string. Okay? So a typical initial velocity, for instance, might be as boring as zero. So for instance, if I take a string, like a guitar string, and I hold it up and I let it go, then that has an initial displacement, but zero initial velocity because you're holding it and then you let it go. Um, this might be opposed to a, a string which is already in motion at time t is equal to zero, okay, in which you would have a non-zero velocity. Okay, so um, so now we we want to apply Fourier series to study this type of problem. You're going to do the same um, procedure. You're going to do separation of variables. You're going to get your constants, solve for your lambdas, and then form a Fourier series. Okay, so it's the same procedure, and as always, you want to check beforehand that, that you have zero Dirichlet conditions. If you don't have zero Dirichlet conditions, remember that you need to treat it separately. And I'm not quite sure whether this is treated in the problem sets. I'm going to have to verify whether it's treated in the problem sets. But at the end of the day, just make sure I've got zero Dirichlet conditions. I'm ready to go with the separation of variables. So in the first step, you're going to set. Um, u of xt equal to big X of x times a big T of t. I'm using a big T of t here. I noticed in the, pro in the, um, the lecture notes this morning when I read them over that this is a g of t, just because sometimes you don't want to get confused with temperature, you see. So um, I prefer a, a big T of t. And then you put this into the PDE and you separate. So as usual, you have a t double prime. Um, Let's just write it out in full. So you have a t double prime times x times a c squared x double prime times t. And then you'll move the x's over to one side and then move t's over to the other side. So let's move the x's over. 
um, like this. I'll move the C squared over just by analogy with how we treated the lambda. Um, but you remember we did this little demonstration in the last tutorial in the last class that you don't have to move the C squared over. You can keep it on this side. It doesn't change the final answer, but it changes some of the intermediate steps. Okay. So this is then equal to a constant. Let's do the same thing as we did last time. Let's call this to a sigma, and then you have to treat the different cases, sigma greater than zero, sigma less than zero, sigma equal to zero, okay? Um, the final answer is going to be sigma less than sometimes or equal to zero. Sometimes you have to include the zero, sometimes you don't. Um, and the case where sigma is greater than zero uh, is not going to be involved in this case, but you should show that yourselves. Um, should I show you how to do it? I might as well show you, just so I think it's good to be complete, so I'll show you here how to, how to do all the different cases. Um, but we're trying to do it quickly, okay? So we have case one. For the case one, let's take sigma greater than zero and take sigma equal to, say, lambda squared, which is greater than zero. Okay, and let's solve those two sets of equations. So now we have to solve x double prime is equal to um, lambda squared times x. And then I have a t double prime is equal to c squared times lambda squared times t. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you how to do this in two ways. There's actually a, a much better way using hyperbolic functions. You don't have to do it with hyperbolic functions if you don't want to, but um, it's one of the reasons why hyperbolic functions are actually useful. Okay, so I first need a boundary condition for this problem, so I have to go back to these two conditions and figure out what the boundary conditions are. So let's write that over here. So as usual, you'll write x of 0 times big T of t is equal to 0, so x of 0 is equal to 0. And then this one here will have x of l equal to 0, like so. Okay? So now you're going to... Uh, Put that into here, and then let's solve for the x's. We're not going to actually need the times right now, so let's solve for the x's. So um, there's two ways of doing it, okay? The, the way that most of you are comfortable with is that you know that this gives you exponentials, right? It's e to something times x plus e to that negative times x. So in this case, let, let me call this um, item 1 here. Then item 1 here will give you basically that x is equal to... Um, a e to the lambda times little x plus b e to the minus lambda times little x. Yeah, that's right. So um, we're we're just going we're just being quite meticulous here. I'm going through the different cases lambda. Um, sorry, someone has asked why are we doing all this case all these different cases. It's sort of up to you. In the past, I've assumed that you would be able to just jump to the, lamb, uh, the sigma negative or equal to zero case. But I think um, in the last two years in which I've taught the course, this question comes up, people aren't quite sure which one should I do. So I'm just going to do it when I cover it the first time around. I'm just going to go do all the different cases so you see it. And then we're going to take it that you know that you're going to jump right to the relevant case, okay? Okay, so I have this now, now I'm going to impose these two boundary conditions, and when I impose the boundary conditions, I have essentially two equations to solve. I have a plus b is equal to zero, okay, because, um, uh, because uh, you set x equal to zero here, and I set um, a e to the lambda times l plus b e to the minus lambda times l is equal to zero. Okay, and you can verify that the only solution of this equation is essentially the trivial solution. So this gives you a equal to b equal to zero. Okay, so you can set b is equal to minus a, put it into here, and then use the property of the exponentials to argue that they, so you'll, you'll stick b is equal to minus a into the second equation factor out the a in the front, and so you have a times e to the lambda l minus e to the minus lambda l is equal to zero, and then you argue that this guy can never, is never equal to zero, 
um, for non-trivial L. And so A has to be equal to zero. And so you, you conclude that A is equal to B is equal to zero. Okay, so that's, that's one way of doing it. I'm just gonna very quickly show you the other way of doing it, which is worth learning anyways. The other way to doing it is to notice that, um, and if you get nervous with hyperbolic functions, if you get nervous with hyperbolic functions, um, you might just not listen for the next minute or two, but it's worth knowing, okay? So you know that you have the cosh function, cosh of x or lambda x, and you have the cinch of lambda x. And these two functions are essentially linear combinations of these two exponentials. They're, so the cosh of lambda times x is basically e to lambda x plus e to the minus lambda x, whereas the, the cinch of lambda x is a combination of e to lambda x minus e to lambda minus lambda x. So instead of writing your solution in this form, there's a trick that you can write it in as different constants. Let me call it c times cosh of lambda times x plus d times cinch of lambda times x. So you could have equally written it in this representation instead of the exponentials. And you say, well, well I don't understand why that's a convenient thing to do. What's convenient about this is that you know um, that one of these two functions is actually zero at the origin. So you know the cinch function looks like that, whereas the cosh function looks like that. In other words, if you were to set x equal to zero into this equation here, the cinch disappears, leaving you with cosh of zero, which is non-zero, and you would conclude that c is equal to zero, you see. So by the properties of the cosh and the cinch function, x of zero is just c times cosh of zero, and so this has to be equal to zero, and that tells you that c has to be equal to zero. And then you're left to conclude that d times cinch of lambda times l has to be equal to zero. But if you look at the graph of that function, that's at some location here, the only way that's equal to zero is if d is equal to zero. I've covered this quite quickly, um, but... So now you have this times cinch of lambda times L equal to zero, and by the property of the cinch function, this is never non-zero except at the origin. And so the only way is if D is equal to zero. Okay. I can't help myself into kind of explain this technique because it, it, it does make life really simple. It's one of the reasons why you use the cosh and the cinch, because the cosh and the cinch are particular combinations of the exponentials which are zero at the origin, right? If you didn't do it like this, you could have equally done it e to lambda times x plus e to the minus lambda times x, but then you notice that the system of two equations is not as easy, it's not as elegant to solve because um, adding together two exponentials at the origin is not nat naturally setting one of the components to be. Okay? Um, don't have to know this, I think it's more for curiosity's sake. If you wanted to do it, just do it with the exponentials and then just do it in the same way that we, we just wrote down a minute ago. If you want to do it with the hyperbolic uh, uh, um, co cosine and sine functions, the cosh and the cinch functions that you learned in first year and you probably forgot, or you might have learned in A-levels and you might have forgotten, um, then you could do that as well. That's a perfectly valid solution. Okay, so at the end of the day, you would have concluded that this is equal, this case is trivial, okay? And then now we're going to move on to case two here. And in case two, I have sigma equal to zero. We're going to do that case separately as well. Sometimes you can combine it together with the sigma less than or equal to zero case, but we'll do the sigma equal to zero case. So let's set sigma equal to zero. Okay. And then now the set of two equations you're going to solve, this is equal to zero. So x double prime is equal to zero and t double prime is equal to zero, and now you just have linear functions of both. Okay, so this tells you that x is some, say, ax plus b. And we're not going to bother just uh, writing down the t, but you could, it's just some ct plus d. 
Okay, so now you're going to impose those two boundary conditions, but the only line that goes through zero at zero and goes through zero at L is the trivial line, right? So um, x zero being zero tells you that b is equal to zero, and x of L being zero then consequently tells you that a is equal to zero. The only line that goes through zero on both sides is just the trivial line, and you're left with the trivial solution. Okay. So now we have finally, that, that was case number two, sigma equal to zero. And then finally we have case um, number three, sigma is less than zero. And so for convenience, let's set my sigma to be minus lambda squared. I think in the chat it's been asked and also been answered of why you, why do we always set it to be something squared? That's just, um, you'll see in a second. It's for convenience. It's because you end up, if you didn't do that, you would have square roots all over the place. Okay? So now um, you put this into here and solve it. So the, the sets of two equations are x double prime equal to minus lambda squared times x. The same equation as the heat equation. And t double prime is equal to minus lambda squared times t. Now this is different from the heat equation, right? For the heat equation, we have one derivative in time. Now we've got two derivatives in time, okay? So, uh, but it's the same thing. So now I have oscillatory solutions. I have an a times uh, cosine of lambda times x plus b times the sine of lambda times x. And then here, this tells me I have t is equal to c times uh, cosine. And then, oh, I have to be a bit careful. I'm missing a c squared. I think if I look at the chat, someone would have reminded me. Oh, you're all being a bit slow. You didn't, you didn't remind me that I forgot this c squared. But there is a c squared there. This should be a uh, lambda ct plus d times sine of lambda ct. <laughs> OK. Someone did eventually remind me, but I don't know whether that came uh, before or after. Okay, so it's the same as the heat equation. The only difference is that for the heat equation, we had exponentials here. We had an exponential decay. Uh, now we've got oscillatory. And that makes sense, okay? So these are essentially deflections of the string. Okay? There's no damping in the string. There's nothing that's going to slow down the um, deflections of the string. So we're expecting the solution to be oscillatory in x and also oscillatory in t, okay? All right. If, and you can modify this equation, um, by the way, for the string equation to include damping, in which case this would then turn into some kind of decay if you had some kind of damping, some kind of frictional force in there. All right, so now we need to impose the boundary conditions uh, on the x, okay? And it's going to be, you, you can see that it's, it's going to be identical to the heat equation, okay? So we'll be able to skip to the solution. Um, well, might as well do it. So x of 0 being 0, let's put 0 into here. The sign disappears. That tells me that a is equal to 0. And then x of l being 0 tells me that I have b times sine of lambda times l has to be 0. So lambda times l has to be a multiple of pi. So lambda is equal to n pi over l. And usually n has to go through all the integers, including the negative integers. But at the end of the day, you'll reason that because it's the, 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 the negative ones are absorbed by the constant in front of the sign, then you don't need the negative ones. And you also don't need the 0 one, n is equal to 0, because that corresponded to the sigma equal to 0 case, which is the trivial solution. Okay, so um, hopefully by now that's standard. If not, then just keep on doing the heat equation and um, review your notes. The heat equation is the same technique. So we've emerged with the correct separable solutions. Let's write them down. So at the end of the day, our separation, um, we find that we have separable solutions. We're going to index them with an n, as we usually do. They're functions of x and t. 
okay? For the x component, we only have the sinusoidals, so this is going to be a b... I'm not... Uh, I won't write that as a bn just yet, just I don't think I need it. Um, this is going to be a lambda n times x here, and I'll, I'll write down lambda n uh, right here. So lambda n is n pi over l, okay? And then I have to multiply this, I'll help you do that on the next line, times a c times a cosine of lambda n times c times t, plus a d times a sine of lambda n times c times t, like this, okay? Uh, do you need to do the sigma equal to zero case? That's a good question here. So, no, you, you didn't need to, but, okay, so I'll answer it in this way. You could combine the sigma equal to zero case to be handled by the n is equal to zero case here. So you could combine it. So in, when you consider this to be a minus lambda squared, you can consider lambda squared less than or equal to zero, okay? And then you go away and you solve for your different equations. You get cosine plus uh, sine, sine and cosines for both components. And at the very end of the day, you would say, well, if n is equal to zero, this corresponds to the case of sigma is equal to zero. The only problem with that, you see, is that it's not in the case where let sigma is equal to zero, the solution is given by linear functions, right? Ax plus b uh, uh, and ct plus d for the two uh, space and time components. So actually, you wrote down the wrong solutions. You wrote down sines and cosines. You didn't write down the right solutions for that sigma equal to zero case. It so turns out that if you did it with the this being less than or equal to zero, and you just treat it like cosines and sines, it happens to yield just the trivial solution. But you have to be sure and do it separately, the sigma is equal to zero case separately. Um, and I think in the problem sets, there's an example where if you don't do the sigma equal to zero case separately, you don't get those linear functions, the ax plus b and the ct plus d, and you would have end up with the wrong solution because for that problem in the problem sets, you need those linear components. Okay, so you do want to treat the sigma equal to zero case uh, separately. But as, as we said, it turns out that we only need the n is equal to one, two, and all the positive integers in this case. Okay? Um, here, we're going to move on to the next line, and then we're going to absorb the constants together. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to call b times c to be a new constant, because this is just a constant, yes? I'm going to write this as sine of lambda n times x, and then I'm just going to make sure this is the same as in the notes. Okay, so this is going to be an a n, so I'm going to call b times c to be a n of cosine of lambda uh, m c t plus a, we'll write b times d to be bm, just another constant, times that lambda and ct combination, okay? It's a bit messy, I'll just clean this up a little bit. So this is un of x and t, and then you go and you stick your lambda n's here, lambda n is just n pi over l, okay? So it looks a lot like the heat equation. The solution for the heat equation had this sine component in there. It didn't have these two oscillatory components in time. It had an exponential in time. Okay? And the other difference that you'll notice is that for the heat equation, you only had one constant. You only had one constant in front of the exponential. Here you have two constants, which makes sense because you have two conditions to satisfy, a displacement, displacement and a velocity. Okay. So this is the final solution. You're now going to, this is the final separable solution, and then what you're going to do is you're going to now uh, form the Fourier series of this, and then uh, form the Fourier series, of, and then apply the boundary conditions, okay? Um, in order for me to be consistent with the notes, I'm going to, we're gonna pause for a little bit before we apply the Fourier series to determine those coefficients, and when we're going to examine these, what are the, these, these are called modes. We're going to look at what these look like, okay? So um, let's flash my screen up now.
Okay, so here we go. Uh, so just to remind you that I'm putting the notes up and you can go to the main website here and then access the notes as we go. I've been a little bit slow. I've not, if I click lecture 24, for example, you'll notice I say need to write this. I've not quite written it, but I try to link the video in each of these notes. So it just gives you an easy way of um, seeing what we did during the lectures. So let's go to lecture 25 here. And this is what we've covered so far. We've covered the, the wave equation. We've covered the separation of variables procedure. I don't go in detail in these notes. Um, I just kind of say, well, in the video, we'll, we'll cover these, these aspects. And then uh, I want to talk about this example 16.2 in the notes. So this is what I call imagining the modes. Okay. So this is what we just found. We found that the separable solutions are given by a sine here, a sine of x, and then two cosines and sines in t. And just for simplicity, let's set the length of the string to be equal to pi and set the wave speed c is equal to 1. So now we, we have these as the individual separable solutions. Okay. Just to remind you, we often refer to these as the modes. You refer to this as the mode the nth mode of, of the solution. And so you think of the solution as basically a Fourier series, a, a general solution of all of these with different ends added together. And the question of this example, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, this should be C is equal to one. Thank you. I'll make sure I correct that. Uh, the, the intention of this example is for you to ex uh, try to imagine what these solutions look like. Okay, so in, in essence, what your claim is, is that for a complicated string, so you imagine any arbitrary string like a guitar string and you hit it or you strum it. And what happens is that string goes into motion and that motion might be extremely complicated, right? It might not be just a very simple sine or a cosine. It's some complicated looking um, uh, displacement of the string or you hit a drum or some other object and that forms um, a vibration and you're asking well what does that vibration look like and part of our claim is that you can essentially add together many of these solutions and then that forms that complex shape that's the whole idea of Fourier series and so what we want to do here is we want to imagine what each one of these individual modes look like okay and so um, I've written a little MATLAB code for that. I'll walk you through the MATLAB code. Um, okay. So this code looks a bit complicated, but it's not actually that complicated. It's very simple. You're just plotting simple functions, but it's just doing it in a way that makes it look pretty, essentially. So we're going to set the length of the string to be pi, and then set the uh, this c to be equal to 1. This is a bit of a mistake. I think the c should appear up here. One. And the other thing that I'll mention uh, is better that I just remove the display here and go back to camera. Huh. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, hopefully that the display is now off. I just want to mention this fact. Uh, let's look at the individual mode here. So I have cosine of lambda n, and let's stick it in. So I have a lambda n, n pi ct over l, okay, for this, for the thing that goes in the time component, okay. So I want to ask you, first of all, what is the period of this oscillation? So you know that if I have cosine of k times x, or k times t, okay, then the period of this is essentially 2 pi over k. And okay, so the period here is equal to 2 pi over the thing in front of the t. So this is 2 pi over the thing uh, in front of the t, and so you invert it, l over n pi c, like this, okay? And so if L is equal to pi, and if C is equal to 1, this is just 2 pi over M. Uh, if 
that was equal to pi. So yeah, okay, it's just two pi over n. Okay. In other words, this complicated looking cosine component repeats every two pi over n um, time. Okay. All right. Let's see. Now back to the display. So this is basically what I'm setting this capital T to be. So I'm saying I want to basically plot in time. And I instead of saying an arbitrary time period, I say let's plot from time t is equal to 0 to t is equal to 10. I'm just going to make sure that I always hit multiples of the period just for simplicity. So this capital T is essentially defining that thing that I said before. It's 2 pi over c times n. c is just equal to 1. And then we're going to set up that un function. Okay, so if I um, go back to this thing here, I'm going to create that function there where this c is equal to 1, or I, I set it for the general case. And that's this thing here. Okay, and then we're going to essentially Okay, so next we're going to make a vector in x and then a vector in time. So the vector in x runs from 0 to pi. It's got 50 points in there. And the vector in time runs from 0. And here's where I use the period in time. So I'm going to plot two periods in time. So you can repeat, so you can see the motion repeat twice. That's essentially this factor of 2. And we're going to put 50 points in there. Okay. Now, this is a one-dimensional vector, okay? So it's basically just a series of points from 0 to pi, 50, 50 points. In order for you to plot a surface, for each value of x and each value of t, you need to use this mesh grid command, okay? Um, don't worry about it. If, if you're confused at this point of what this mesh grid is, don't worry about it too much. You can always look into it afterwards. I'm also setting, that's a good question, I'm also just going to help us imagine what the cosine mode is going to be, okay? So I'm going to basically set a n to be equal to 1, and I'm going to set b n equal to 0. So that will help us imagine one possible, the, the cosine component of the mode. If you want, you can set a n equal to 0 and set b n equal to 1, and that allows you to imagine the sine component, the sine n c t of the mode. Okay, but this is just, we don't have to go through all the different cases. The important thing is that you get a feel for what the solutions look like. Okay, so um, now all this complicated commands are to plot it. I'm not going to bother explaining it and kind of wasting time here. It's, it's on the website for you to test out yourselves if you want to run it. But let's just do our best to describe um, the pictures. Okay, and we have a, an error here because this n needs to be defined up here. And we're going to look at firstly at the u1 mode, the n, the little n equal to 1. Set little n here equal to 1, okay? So let's run that. Hopefully it runs now. And it does. Uh, and there looks to be a bit of an error. I'm going to have to make sure I correct this. Thing. Why? Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, silly. I didn't rehearse this beforehand, but here we are. I'm missing a pi here, I'm missing a pi here. Why it looks so strange. Okay, let's try again. Ah, here we go. Okay. So, let, let me explain what you're seeing on the graph, okay? So firstly, let's look at the left graph. This left graph is simply plotting the solution at t is equal to zero. Okay, remember, this is just, it's, it's kind of, it's not really a, well, it's one of the possible solutions of the wave equation. One of the possible modes. We're setting n is equal to one, a n here equal to one, and b n equal to zero, just so we can imagine what this component looks like. And this is the solution that you see. 
okay? This is at t is equal to zero. Now on the right graph here is a three-dimensional plot of x, t, and u, okay? So um, let me run the solution in time and you're going to see the, something happen to the picture on the right and then I'll explain it. We'll run it again and I'll explain it. So I'm gonna first start time and then you're gonna notice that this wave is going to move, okay? Okay, so this has run through two periods in time, okay? That's the two times here. And what you're noticing is that it forms a standing wave, okay? So a standing wave is uh, essentially one in which the, the nodes here at x equal to zero is fixed in time. So this point here and this point, of course, is fixed at zero. And essentially, the, the max becomes a min, and the min becomes a max, and etc. Now, the picture on the right is essentially the surface that's formed, if I think of u of x and t. x on this horizontal axis, t going into the page. So if I look straight down into the t direction, then basically that's this picture on the left. Uh, but you can just think of it in the three-dimensional sense, okay? So as time increases, you're basically moving towards the t direction. Let's run it again so we can just see. Okay, so let's run it in time. All right. Okay, and so this is basically one of the possible solutions of the wave equation, right? And in many ways, you're saying that a complex wave form, basically a, a complicated string, when you hit a string on a guitar, or you hit it on a drum, you hit your drum, it's going to form a complicated motion, but the motion is thought of as superpositions of these modes, these building blocks, okay? So we could, of course, set n is equal to 2 here, set little n is equal to 2 and run it, and you're going to see something slightly more complicated now. So now, instead of that form with a, only a single hump, you see one with, base, I mean, it's basically a, a, a sign of two times what we had before. And now if I run it, this is the n is equal to two solution, you see? Okay, so what you're basically saying is that a complicated string, and then I can go to n is equal to 3, let's just try that. This is now n is equal to 3. So essentially what you're saying is that any complicated motion of the string can be thought of as superpositions of all these solutions just with different scalings and uh, scaling factors in, in front of them, right? So you add uh, one times the first one plus, say, a half times the next one plus a third times the next one and so forth and so on. That's your Fourier series. And if you wanted to, you can plot the cosine components, but the cosine components will be um, very, very similar to the sine components. Um, it, did we want to, sorry, we can plot the sine components, but the sine components will be very similar. We might as well try. Let's go back to n is equal to one here and plot the sine component. Uh, the sine component, I was gonna say it's very boring, but no, it just starts off looking quite boring. Okay, so it's, it's just slightly out of phase with the other one. It's basically the, the other solution shifted uh, with a phase shift. Okay, but in general, the each individual mode is seen as essentially superpositions of these two ones. And then you pick, you have to tune the AN and the BN appropriately um, to, 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 to get the, the form that you want. Can I plot cosine and sine added together? Sure, why not? Let's just see. I have no idea what it's going to look like. Let's just try it together. So we're going to put it at a cosine here. Um, let's see. 
I, I guess we could make it the same amplitude each one, or I can scale one of them to be, say, a half of, of, of the first one. But let's just see what this looks like. Ah, okay, okay. So it looks like it, it looks initially the same, of course, because when, um, when t is equal to zero, the sign disappears. So you, you're left with the, the initial solution you had before. Um, but now the evolution in time is a little bit more interesting. The, it's a bit hard to say why the evolution in time is a little bit more interesting. It looks like the, the peaks here are different in height. Let's scale one of these components. Oops. Let's scale one of these components to be um, half, or let's scale them to be, say, 0 0.2. I'm just now quite curious what this looks like. Let's try 0 0.2. I think it's going to be a little bit boring because there's a way of adding the two functions together. Uh, well, let's just see. So the maxima now is no longer bounded by 1. It's going to be uh, 1, 1 1.2. Bit, bit, bit boring, eh? Not too interesting. Huh. Let's try the n is equal to 2 one. Well, I'm kind of wasting your time now because I'm... I think what, what happens, what eventually... Uh... Yeah, it's not so interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I have a bit of trouble imagining the superposition of the two of them together. I was hoping you get something a little bit more interesting if you if you only add a certain uh, small component of the second one, but apparently not. Okay, so um, let's try to say a few words about how to get those Fourier coefficients. We're we're basically done this this imagining the modes example. In in the problem set, it asks you to basically plot the individual modes. So it's worth doing that example and you'll also read that example in your notes and that should help flesh out um, how to think of these things. In, in essence, what the notes and the problem set just asks you to do is just set C is equal to a simple number, set L equal to a simple number, and try to plot this at different um, points in time. And so for instance, you plot it at time T is equal to zero, you plot at time t is equal to big T, the period, the full period, and you can also plot it at big T uh, over 2. But um, I'd like to go on uh, rather than dwell on that, but it's, there's more there in the notes for you um, if you'd like to find out more. Okay. Okay, so now let's, before we, we've got a few more minutes. Um, before we disband, let's say a few words about getting those Fourier coefficients, um, and then we'll review that again in the next uh, in the next not the next term in the next uh, lecture. So the the waves on the string is the most elementary wave problem you can solve. Right, it's just a one-dimensional problem, but then you get all nice variations. Like, for instance, you can solve the wave equation on a disk, and that's uh, basically a model for a drum. Right? If you hit a circular drum, that forms vibrations or displacements, and then you can try to um, study those uh, vibrations. You can study vibrations or um, the, the wave equation on more general surfaces. So, for instance, you can apply it to model the planet. Right? Think of the Earth, so a, a, a sphere now, or Earth is not quite perfectly spherical, but it's almost a sphere. You can think of the vibrations in the Earth, and that forms um, interesting pictures as well if you try to imagine those modes. So if you go on Wikipedia and you look up spherical modes, um, spherical modes, you'll get pictures which are essentially those vibrations that we just drew, the individual modes for a sphere, and they look very nice and very interesting, and essentially what you're trying to explain is that the vibration of a sphere can be broken down into those spherical modes. Okay, um, let's now just uh, say one quick word about this u, u naught of x. Let's just see how you get this u naught of x. We'll do the v naught of x in the next lecture. Okay, so um, let's call that step three. So we, we form the Fourier series.
So the general Fourier series is u of xt is equal to a sum from n is equal to 1 to infinity of sine of n pi x over L. And then you have a a n times cosine of n pi c t over L plus a b n times sine of n pi c t over L. Like this. Okay? And then what you're going to do is you're going to set t is equal to 0. So the initial condition, let's call it ic, I have a u of x in 0, which is a u naught of x. Okay? That has to be equal to, and then you just simply stick in t is equal to 0 here. When I'm sticking t is equal to 0, the sine disappears, and the cosine of 0 is then 1. And I'm left with just the series of a n times sine of n pi x over L. Aha! Aha, you say, well, this is just the sine series for the u naught of x function. So this here is the sine series for the 2L odd extension of u naught of x. So u naught of x is originally defined. Remember, u naught of x is an initial displacement, right? So, for for instance, suppose I'm I'm going to um, pluck the string like this. This is my L. So I'm going to pick up the string and then just let it go. Okay, this is the u naught of uh, u naught of x function. You form the odd extension of it to minus L and zero. So this is u odd, and so the a n will just be 2 over L times the integral from 0 to L of u naught of x. So it's the same as the heat equation. So this tells you that a n is just 2 over L, the integral from 0 to L of u naught of x times sine of n pi x over L dx. Okay, and you, away you go, and you solve uh, for that function. And then uh, on Thursday, we're going to look at, oh, how do you get the v-naught? It's the same principle, you just have to differentiate that thing. And before you uh, disband, I'm just a little bit curious now, uh, just because I mentioned it, what, what spherical modes turns up when I Google it? And I'm going to do that in the background here. Yeah, so if you Google spherical harmonics, right, this is basically what, what I was discussing, that if you tried to solve for the wave equation on a sphere, okay, just, we're trying to solve for the wave equation on a line. If you tried to solve for the wave equation on the sphere, you end up with... Uh, it's not as bad as this. It lo looks... Horrible, but anyways. Ah, here we are. Okay, so these kinds of pictures. Let's have a look at these kinds of pictures. Yeah, they're related to electron orbitals, but anyways. So if 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 I tried to solve using separation of variables over a sphere, which you can do, it's not hard, right? Um, you would just have to write down your wave equation in spherical coordinates, and you try to solve for those components, they give you these types of pictures, right? So they're very similar to the pictures that we had for the case of waves on a string. These are now just waves on a sphere. And what you're trying to argue is that, for example, let, let me take a sphere and I vibrate the sphere, I hit the sphere, I, or form some kind of motion on that sphere, it's going to cause the sphere to displace, and the, the, the displacement of the sphere can be thought of as superpositions of all of these individual components, right, in some possibly complicated way, right? So you, now that gives you a, an interesting idea of how you study things like earthquakes, right? An, an earthquake that's going to cause the earth to vibrate, you can think of an earthquake as then decompose into different modes, into different spherical um, har what are called harmonics. Sometimes instead of modes, you can say it, it's a harmonic. Um, and so this is basically what you would learn 
So you see, you write down Laplace equation, and you try to do separation of variables. Uh, do we have a separation of variables form here? Yeah, uh, yeah, it was right there, but it, it's a bit, it's, it's this kind of expression here, but um, it, it, I can assure you, it looks a lot more complicated than it actually is. It's just not as elegant. It's not as nice when you do it over a sphere as when you do it over a line. But you get these beautiful pictures, these kinds of um, decompositions of the possible ways on the sphere. Okay, so that's basically it, this class. Um, on Thursday, we'll meet again Thursday at 10.15. We're going to finish up with the wave equation. We're going to do a nice example of what happens when you pluck a string and then you let it go and that forms a, a wave. We're going to plot the solution, solve for it using Fourier series, um, and then just continue to do more examples. Okay, otherwise, um, have a good Tuesday. Have a good Tuesday. I'll see you all 10.15 uh, on Thursday.